Um, my name is Tom Mogan. I serve as a Director of Student Development here at Villanova. I also teach in the History Department. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what, what interests me in this project and, and uh, as we go along here. Uh, but I just want to play for you an audio clip for you to just to think about and kind of set the context for the session today. Okay. Of, uh, uh, of Villanova, uh, where there, there were a lot of youngsters that were concerned about a uh, few things that I was concerned with. So we spent uh, a minimum amount of time uh, on campus socializing compared to transporting people who also grew up in Philadelphia, graduated from Philadelphia high schools, then were going to Villanova. Uh, we spent more time uh, back and forth and discussing matters and, and socializing in Philadelphia because it was uh, convenient. And part of the reason also had to do with the uh, acceptance or the student body at that time, which was predominantly white, um, they were not as cordial and as accepting, I guess cautiously accepting, as they were. But then I had a... Um, an advantage of being a, one of the football players, and that lessened some of the possible rejection from the general student body. Um, football players were, were well-liked or well-received, and there was none of the bigotry or prejudice that existed in, in various parts of Philadelphia during that time. Uh, none of that was evident on campus. So fortunately, it was like a, an oasis of, um, of cordial social acceptability there uh, at Villanova compared to some of the communities uh, in Philadelphia at that time. Okay. An oasis of cordial social acceptability. What, can anyone guess what year this may have been, where, what he's referring to? Uh, obviously, the, the interview was recent, uh, but anybody have a guess? Yes. 64. Okay. Other guesses? Other guesses? The man who was speaking was Al Pride, uh, Dr. Al Pride. He's a uh, retired uh, school administrator and counselor uh, in Decatur, Georgia. I just spoke to him on the phone uh, last week. And uh, he graduated in 1973 and lived on campus. Um, fall of 71, 72. Uh, so uh, this is 1972 uh, in which he is reflecting on uh, the state of uh, relations on campus uh, during this time period. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about you know, this as, as we go along and, and uh, I will uh, try to place that uh, quote into, into context uh, by also looking at uh, how the situation uh, changed over time uh, as historians uh, often do. Okay? Um, so our topic for today, okay, is Black Power at Villanova, the rediscovery of the black student movement uh, of the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Tom Mogan, and uh, there's two phases to this uh, project that uh, we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, one is I'm conducting research for my dissertation, which is on Catholic higher education and during the civil rights movement, black power movement uh, for uh, Temple University and uh, I'm enrolled in a PhD program at Temple, and so this uh, serves as my dissertation topic. I'm also uh, interested in uh, the uh, African-American experience uh, for students uh, here on this campus, um, both in a historical context and, and today as well. Um, and so as part of my dissertation research, I've embarked on a oral history project uh, that seeks to document uh, the historical record of African-American students uh, here at Villanova, with particular emphasis in the period right now of 1955 uh, to 1985. Um, and then I hope to broaden that uh, a little bit uh, as well. Uh, but that, that's the period I'm focusing in, in on right now. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, uh, the objectives of the session today, are uh, to provide some insight on the history of black students at Villanova uh, from the 1950s to the 1970s. Um, we will also uh, try to assess the impact of Dr. King's uh, legacy uh, on Villanova. Uh, Dr. King uh, visited here in 1965, and there's also some 
uh, little known history uh, connections with, with Dr. King and, and an alum, which I will uh, share with you. Um, and we'll also discuss uh, issues of campus inclusion uh, during this time period, as well as look at uh, their relevance to today, uh, campus uh, today um, and in the future as well. Um, and also uh, provide some insight on the Black uh, Villanova Oral History Project uh, that I have spoken about and that I have uh, embarked on um, as of uh, October of last fall. Um, so those are the objectives of the session. I had a little uh, slideshow running uh, previous, and those were uh, yearbook photographs of, uh, that were taken from uh, the Black Student League and, and African American uh, students who were here in uh, the late uh, 1960s. Um, uh, so one of the things that, that really started for me, you know, my interest in this project uh, was I took a, a class, I took taken several classes on uh, civil rights history and always noticed that there was a gap in our knowledge about uh, what was happening in the North during the civil rights movement. Uh, the traditional narrative of the civil rights movement is uh, that Martha, Martin Luther King uh, started a boycott in Montgomery in 1955. Uh, and ro led by Rosa Parks, and, and then there were a few freedom marches and a few um, uh, protests, and, and including Selma and, and Birmingham, and then all of a sudden, you know, legislation was passed, uh, end of story. Well, uh, historians have complicated that traditional narrative uh, throughout the years, and uh, so as we look at the histori historiography of the student civil rights movement, uh, the history of the history of the civil rights movement, uh, we can understand that, that historians are now starting to turn uh, their gaze towards the North and uh, starting to understand uh, what was taking place in the North. Um, and so there have been a great number of books in, in recent years that uh, look at the civil rights movement in the North. Um, as well as there also have been uh, numerous books written on uh, the history of, of higher education and now more and more historians are looking at what was taking place on college uh, campuses and universities uh, during this time period. Um, I have a little technical difficulty here. Let me see what I can do here. Okay. There we go. All right. That should stop the slides from going there. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Okay. Um, and so that, that is really what, what started my, my interest on the project, is that nobody has really written a substantive book on uh, what took place on college campuses uh, during this time period. And so, um, and in the pr process of researching uh, this topic, I also noticed that nobody really focused on the African American student experience and to truly understand uh, the civil rights movement and the black power movement uh, as a whole, uh, we really need to look at college campuses. And in particular, we need to understand uh, the African American student experience uh, on, on college campuses. And uh, I also uh, am deeply interested in Catholic higher education and wanted to understand how uh, the Catholic mission of Villanova uh, informed and um, either strengthened or hindered, you know, the, the uh, civil rights movement um, and the activism of, of their students uh, on campus. Um, and so uh, I began by looking at a uh, recent Villanova history book that was uh, written uh, during the sesquicentennial, um, and it was called Villanova University, which is the 150-year anniversary of, of Villanova, 1842 to 1992. Um, and in the chapter that looked at uh, the civil rights movement, uh, there was a, a paragraph that was written in there, and I quoted from there, on a campus where the number of African American students was negligible, the civil rights movement had little personal relevance and there were, there were no s civil rights demonstrations as such at Villanova. Um, and so I, I, th I thought that was pretty profound. And, and if you look at the context of this and say the civil rights movement as narrowly defined by historians, uh, up until uh, 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was passed, 1964 uh, the Civil Rights Act, and then uh, generally uh, the period of, of civil rights closes with the, um, with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Those are the two major pieces of, of legislation. If you look at it in that narrow context, uh, then Contasta may be um, accurate in terms of uh, the types of protests that happen on campus. Um, but I, I would take uh, issue with uh, the one uh, phrase that he uses there with little personal relevance. Uh, because as you will see, uh, just a quick glance through the Villanovan during this time period, and I would argue that uh, I would extend the, the timeline of the civil rights movement uh, to up until uh, well into the 70s uh, and, and, and include you know, what is traditionally known as the black power movement in, the, in that time frame. 
Um, and so I wanted to sort of correct uh, this historical narrative that looked at, um, that declared that the civil rights movement had little personal relevance to, to people at, at Villanova. Um, and so um, I hopefully uh, will be able to do that. Okay. But let's take a look at the early years. Part of what historians are charged to do is to take a look at uh, change over time and how do things uh, change or remain the same you know, o over time. Uh, so in order to do that, let's understand you know, the, uh, the context of uh, the 1950s and the early years uh, in the 1950s. All right. Um. I apply that to all. Okay. One of my first interviews for the Oral History Project was Dr. Ed Collymore. Uh, Dr. Collymore uh, wa was a student here from 1955 to 19, uh, yeah, 1955 to 1959. Uh, Dr. Collymore came from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and was a track star uh, in high school and received a scholarship offer from, from Villanova. Uh, and so in our three-hour interview uh, last week, uh, he talked a little bit about, um, or last month, I should say, uh, we talked a lot about uh, how he arrived at Villanova. Uh, and, uh, but I want to you to play a couple clips of uh, the types of um, social interactions that he, he witnessed on campus and he, that he experienced on campus. Um, to help uh, lay the groundwork for uh, this, the campus climate during the 1950s. Priest cafeteria. I shouldn't talk about that, but we used to. Uh, we found uh, uh, I. I was. Uh, we really didn't affiliate with with the Villanova students that much. Um, there were times I, I remember though. Um, well, <laughs> the raids in the, in the priest cafeteria. Uh, I shouldn't talk about that, but we used to. Uh, we found them. Uh, um, I. I was. I wouldn't say we, but I was one of the guys with the group of guys from up the fourth floor and we found a way of raiding the uh, priest's uh, refrigerator at night uh, uh, if we were hungry. Um, but um, we really didn't, the only other time we would really see, um, I would really interact with Bill Home students was, um, it seemed every time we had finals, or yeah, finals, uh, there were a group of us, uh, five of us, because it's one column. Rebus, myself, uh, I think it was Charlie Volpe, um, and Jay McAndrews, and uh, one other person I remember. We used to always find a way of, uh, uh, I think Charlie had the car, but we'd drive to um, downtown and we'd find a way of sneaking into the, the theater. And it would watch, that was a big thing, and to, to blow off steam, I guess, come back and we'd have finals. But uh, that was the most time we'd interact, other than um, if we were running in New York, uh, IC forays, indoor IC forays, um, or the Nationals, there was always a large uh, group of, of Villanova students, in fact, sections of them. And, uh, you know, they would be there cheering for us. And afterwards, we would, um, it, it was legal to, to um, <laughs> drink at 18. <laughs> in New York, so we would go by, uh, uh, I guess it was a uh, German, American, there were a couple of restaurants, a couple of drinking establishments. We would go, Bill Nova students would be there, and you know, we were treating, treated with royalty at the time. You know. They'd stand up, we'd walk down the middle, the table for us, and uh, you know, a couple of beers there waiting. Uh, what, what he's uh, referring to is, uh, I asked him a question earlier in the interview um, in terms of uh, the numbers of African American students who were on campus uh, when he arrived in 1955, and he said there were nine, uh, and they were all athletes. And he could name them, you know, by 
uh, he went down and, and named every single one of the uh, people that he knew uh, on campus. Um, and uh, that's the way Villanova uh, first you know, started off uh, in terms of the, the integration of the campus uh, in terms of African Americans. Uh, many of them were athletes. And so um, the, what he's talking about here in, in terms of uh, Charlie Jenkins and Phil Rivas, um, these were uh, teammates uh, and then also uh, friends you know, that, that he developed uh, deep, deep friendships with. Um, they, there's a, uh, another clip that, where he talks about you know, the boys from Boston, and, and he, so he followed in uh, Charlie Jenkins' footsteps uh, to, to Villanova. Uh, he was, uh, they went to the same high school together and, and were both track stars. Um, Charlie Jenkins ended up uh, running in the Olympics in 19, 1956. Uh, Dr. Collymore uh, tried to qualify for the 1960 Olympic team, but uh, suffered an injury uh, that which prevented him from from doing so. Uh, so these were, uh, if you know your Villanova history in terms of sports, uh, you know that, that at this at this time period, uh, track was the flagship uh, athletic team at Villanova. It was uh, nationally renowned and and was um, the sport, you know, much like uh, basketball is uh, today on our camp campus, or women's cross country, if we want to. Uh, judge uh, in terms of uh, the um, success of, of the uh, teams. Um, and so this, the, he's describing you know, the, the situation of, of little interaction. And uh, as you can see, he says Villanova students. Uh, but in, in, in fact, you know, he's talking about uh, the predominant uh, white students on, on campus. Um, a little bit more about the social life on campus. Uh, what was the social life like on campus? There wasn't any on campus. Um, as I said, Sidnor, George Sidnor lived uh, in, in, on Preston Ave in, in Bryn Mawr. And, uh, and, and um, yeah, Bryn Mawr. And um, so we used to hitchhike down there quite often. Uh, or Charlie would drive the car, but most of the time we'd hitchhike there. And uh, Sid seemed to uh, provide us with, he would tell us where the parties were. and. And uh, dances in, in Oddmore and Radnor, and um, yeah, so we, you know, we, we made the best of it as, as we could. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Collymore also described uh, on campus. We went to get a uh, an incident involving a student. Uh, the Doherty Hall, uh, the, where the barbershop is today, uh, that has been a barbershop since uh, the early 50s. And so uh, there was a campus barbershop uh, where the IK or the Italian, uh, where the Italian ki kitchen is or the corner grill uh, used to be known as the pie shop. And that was the place where everybody uh, hung out. So Doherty Hall was uh, provided a lot of the uh, social life on campus in terms of uh, places, places to hang out. Um, and so Dr. Collymore describes uh, an incident with the African-American student and uh, the barbershop, which again uh, speaks to um, you know, the inclusive nature of, of campus at, at, at that time. A haircut, and of course the barbershop was downstairs, and uh, Frank Gilbert, right? And um, the barbershop was downstairs, and he, they didn't cut, did not want to cut his hair, and I know he came up stairs here and this is where the dean's office was and, and of course this building was built um it opened up my second semester of my freshman year uh, but what happened um he uh, you know the the priest in charge or whoever he saw remedied the situation and uh, i never knew what happened about two years ago i ran into someone and he had some affair and he says oh yeah i used to be the barber, one of the barbers downstairs, and I said, oh yeah, and then he, he, uh, he told me the incident, he was, wasn't was the head barber, he was the person who owned it, and um, he said, when Frank came in, and Frank went upstairs, and the priest came downstairs and told the person, if you want to work on campus, you will cut his hair, and anyone else is here who came in, and that, that resolved it. So the positive aspect of the story is that the administration uh, acted on behalf of the students and, and rectified the situation, um, but um, that didn't stop you know, the, uh, the initial incident from happening. Right? Um, 
And so that lays a little bit of the groundwork in terms of the, the social uh, relations on campus and the campus climate uh, for African American students in, in the mid to late uh, 1950s. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about as we go on. But um, I, I want the session to be interactive. So if you have any questions or uh, thoughts, reactions to anything you've you've heard so far, yes. What's your name? Um, I'm Alex. Alex. Um, I'm Clinton. I wanted to know uh, did Dr. Um, Collins Morgan um, uh, education? Yeah, he received his PhD in, in, in education. Um, he, he ultimately came back here to work as the first uh, director of uh, social action uh, in 1967 or 68, I believe. Uh, but then he just retired from Villanova in 2004 um, as the, the executive director of the, the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Um, One of the major figures of the uh, not late 1950s was a man named George Rabling. George came in uh, 1957 when uh, Ed was a sophomore or junior, I believe. Um, and he ultimately was named uh, team captain of the basketball team. Uh, and he was the first African-American captain of a Villanova uh, basketball or a Villanova uh, athletic team in, in general. Um, and uh, he was a tremendous uh, basketball player, known as a, uh, a great rebounder, um, and was very active in, in on-campus life, uh, both as a student and then after he, he graduated. Um, so in, he came back uh, to work at Villanova in the mid uh, to late 60s as an assistant coach uh, for the basketball team and helped uh, their recruiting efforts. And, and uh, in particular, uh, he was known for uh, recruiting uh, guys from the South to, to come up to, to Villanova, uh, basketball players like Johnny Jones and Jim McIntosh. Um, but in 1963, August of 1963, uh, George Raveling ended up in Washington, D.C. Uh, for uh, the Martin Luther King I Have a Dream uh, speech. Um, and so I want to play you this little video. Uh, we won't watch the whole thing, but this video clip, um, and you can discover one of the little known facts of uh, Villanova history. Certainly be a special anniversary for longtime college and Olympic <laughs> national basketball consultant for Nike. August 28th will mark the 40th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, a massive peaceful march in support of civil rights legislation. On that day in 1963, a young George Raveling was present to witness one of the most dynamic speeches in history, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. To be present for an event so historic is memorable, but it is the speech itself and a chance encounter with Dr. King which link Raveling to the man and to the march. Here's Jim Huber. For George Raveling, that moment came on a sweltering August day in 1963, when his life would change forever. He was fresh out of Villanova, searching for something, when he and a friend ventured onto the Washington Mall the night before the march. We were walking around and we encountered a gentleman and we started a conversation. He said, hey, are you guys coming tomorrow? We said, yeah, that's why we're in town. And he said, would you have any interest in working tomorrow? And we said, well, what will we have to do? He said, well, we're really short on security people. They were expecting uh, around 250,000 people. As it turned out, they got close to half a million people. So he said, uh, we could use you. And so uh, we said, fine, we'll do it. And so uh, the next morning, we were all excited, woke up early. We were supposed to be there at 9 o'clock, and we got there at 8. So we were the first ones to show. And so he said, look, uh, you guys can work up uh, at the security at the speaker's podium. Were you warned of threats against his life? I don't think there was any imminent threat to King's life or any of the other dignitaries. I think that they had made a promise to themselves that we're going to show the world that we can do this and we can do it in a respectful and, and orderly manner. It was the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, and yet only that month had a civil rights bill been sent to Congress. 
They were there in the shadow of Lincoln as the conscience of a beleaguered people. Finally, as the summer sun began to tease the tops of the monuments, young George Ravelin heard the stirring crescendo. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the day's 16th speaker, began what was to become one of the most famous orations of the 20th century. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. There's a cadence and a rhythm to his speech that captured you. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Everyone electrified by his words. One of the most emotional moments that I've ever realized in my lifetime. When we allow freedom to reign, when we let it reign from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free So the speech is over, and what happens then? There's a massive ovation, and people are, are moving uh, around, and I happen to slide up to the, to the uh, podium, and for some reason, uh, I said, Dr. King, could I have that copy? And he turned and handed to me. George Ravelin coached college basketball for 31 years at Washington State, Iowa, and Southern Cal, before turning to television and a position with Nike. The speech, 1,740 words on three pages, has been with him every step of the way. But its echoes and not its typeset. For the one delivered that afternoon varies dramatically from the one under glass in Ravelin's home. You'll see as if you put the uh, listen to the speech on audio, and you'll see that that many times uh, he, he shortens sentences, he changes words, but he stays with the basic content uh, until we get down uh, uh, toward uh, this, this portion here on the last page, on page three. And, and at this point, he begins to deviate from the speech and he goes into the I Have a Dream part. The media uh, gave the speech the title, I Have a Dream. The speech actually never had a title. The idea of having a dream uh, is important to all of us. I mean, have you emphasized that over the years with, with the kids that you've coached? Uh, uh, m most certainly. I, I Not only do I emphasize it with the players I've coached, I emphasize it uh, uh, on a constant basis when I speak. The key thing is once you have that dream, is to work diligently to make that dream uh, become a, a reality. When you, when you think about so, <laughs> Villanova alum you know, holds, you know, probably the most important speech in, uh, you know, in our lifetimes, uh, my, at least my, my, you know, my lifetime, um, and you know, possibly the world, right? Um, so, it's. Um, I read a story where uh, I believe he was trying to negotiate with the the King Center in Atlanta to try to to donate it. Um, and I'm not sure how the negotiations uh, ended up, but uh, he still holds on to the, to the speech uh, to this day. Um, and uh, George was back uh, several years ago. He served as an honorary coach uh, for one of the teams during uh, Hoops Mania. Um, and unfortunately, it was before I started my project. So uh, I've been in, uh, trying to get in touch with him and contact with him to uh, uh, interview him for the oral history project. But um, he's a very busy man uh, out in... Uh, California, uh, or he may be out in Oregon, uh, where, where Nike headquarters are, because now he works for uh, Nike in their, in their international uh, development uh, department. Um, so, just a connection to Martin Luther King on this Martin Luther King celebration. Um, as many of you may be aware, uh, we highlighted this during the Martin Luther King Day of Service. Um, <clears throat> Martin Luther King was at Villanova. Uh, in January 1965 and delivered a, a speech to a sold-out and packed uh, Jake Nevin Fieldhouse where they 
uh, crammed in over 2,500 people to listen to, uh, to Dr. King. Um, and I have a copy of the speech you know, that he gave uh, that night uh, that I got out of the uh, university archives. Um, and um, so, it, it, again, not having been there, not having seen the tape, you know, he may have de uh, deviated from the speech as he did uh, with the I Have a Dream uh, speech, um, but he spoke a lot about uh, the coming struggle in, in terms of civil rights um, and that, that the battle, you know, was not finished um, and that um, he uh, seemed to gear his speech, you know, towards what he felt was a, a predominantly uh, white audience. Um, and I'll just uh, have a quote uh, for you here. Um, he says, every white person in the United States of America must grant civil rights to the Negro, not merely because the law says it, says it, but because it is natural and right and because the Negro is his brother. If we are to solve the problem, ultimately men must not merely be obedient to that which, which can be enforced by the law. They must rise to the majestic heights of being obedient to the unenforceable. Uh, so he's, he's calling people to a greater, uh, a greater good. Um, in trying to inspire college students uh, to seek change and to live for change, uh, he says um, that if a man has not discovered uh, something that he would die for, he is not fit to live. Uh, the nonviolent discipline says this, that it is possible to stand up against an evil system, even risking life itself in order to arouse the confidence of the community not engaged in violence and hatred in the cause of it. And, and so this is a powerful resort. Another thing about this is it gives individual ways to bring into being uh, moral, me moral ends to a moral means. Um, and he ended his speech, uh, much like he did in, um, on that day uh, on the Washington Mall, uh, where he says, at this stage we will be able to adjourn the councils of despair and bring into being a new and great day. Uh, Till this day we will be able to somehow transform the dangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. We will be able to speed up the day when all of God's children all over this nation, black men and, black and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, free at last. Um, so this was January uh, 20th, 1965 uh, on Villanova's campus. Um, Martin Luther King uh, was uh, assassinated in April of uh, 1968, and that uh, marked um, a low point in terms of um, in terms of uh, the civil rights movement, and and, and uh, the um, also marked you know sort of a, a low point in, in uh, campus um, climate in terms of how how uh, people reacted to this. On the one hand, it brought people together. And uh, there was a interfaith prayer service that was a, uh, attended by a few hundred people uh, in Jake Nevin Fieldhouse, uh, but in other ways it sort of uh, exacerbated you know tensions that that were there. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the white student reaction in, in, in a little bit. But I just thought this was uh, in terms of the timeline here after the, the Martin Luther King's assassination, um, a white Villanovan editor uh, writer, uh, Rick Serrano, writes, I'm no longer proud of being white. And this is in, in uh, reaction to uh, the King assassination. Um, Serrano proceeded to declare that, that he used to be proud of his whiteness, even though he was self-described as, in quote, only a WAP. Okay. Um, now, however, Serrano indicated, for the first time in my life, I can honestly say that I wish I were black. Uh, Serrano, Serrano rec recounted an incident at a local drugstore where a bigoted man behind him in line loudly suggested that in the wake of King's death, they ought to do the same uh, to the whole lot of them, to millions of them. Serrano indicated that he felt hate, then shame, but in the end, he simply paid his money and walked out of the store. Um, so this, I think, shows, you know, the sort of, uh, the limits, you know, to uh, the... Um, the feelings that oftentimes um, white students had. Uh, they felt anger, they felt resentment, they felt um, hate, you know, in, in some regards, okay, but, um, you know, were they courageous enough to do something about it? Were they courageous to, to make change? Were they courageous to stand up, you know, for what was right in the face of, um, in the face of a, a society uh, that was um, largely, you know, predominantly white and, and um, so it just calls that in, into question. 
Uh, what, ha what really changed from the time we looked at, uh, from the time of the mid-1950s in the campus climate uh, to 1968, uh, was increasing numbers of African-American students on campus. Uh, and there were also an increasing number of, of African-American uh, students who were non-athletes uh, on campus. And this had to do with um, lots of factors. And, and one of it w was the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and the civil, civil rights uh, movement in general uh, caused people to um, embrace diversity, embrace uh, inclusion, and uh, so Villanova uh, sought to uh, recruit uh, African American uh, students. And George Raveling was uh, a very big part of that. Even as an assistant basketball coach, he oftentimes was called on uh, to help recruit uh, general African American uh, students uh, to campus. Um, and so uh, what I'm uh, trying to uh, work out and, and understand through these interviews uh, with black students on campus at, at, at the time uh, was how did, what, what started this movement? Because it's obvious, you know, by 1968 uh, that black students are starting to uh, become more conscious of uh, their culture and, and to try to um, make the campus a more welcoming and more inclusive uh, environment and also uh, to advocate uh, more forcefully for, for their rights. Uh, and so uh, part of it, I think, is, is the numbers of African-American students uh, were increased uh, greatly, and therefore uh, there is uh, courage in numbers. And, and, but I also think it also had to do with uh, what was happening in the larger country at the time, uh, 1968. Uh, it was one of the most tumultuous years in terms of activism uh, for college students uh, and for uh, the general pu public um, across the United States. Um, so I, I term 1968 as a year of awakening, you know, both in, in terms of the nation and, and on uh, campus. Um, and I'll tell you a little about a, a few uh, incidents here. Um, first off, January 1968, um, and I, I argued that black athletes you know, on campus and in society in general often uh, times drove the conversation and drove um, and implored people to think about uh, what was next in terms of, in terms of human rights. And uh, so again, 1964, uh, Civil Rights Act was passed, 1965, Voting Rights Act was pa were passed, uh, which then um, did away with all legal barriers to uh, segregation and and uh, but what was next and that was uh, full inclusion into into society um, and so black athletes argued for uh, things like increased representation of, of blacks on uh, teams um, if there was was increased representation uh, then they wanted uh, black staff members they wanted black uh, coaches um, and people who um, uh, served, you know, the athletic departments. They wanted increased diversity in, in those areas as well. Uh, and so these were some of the demands that were coming out of uh, the black athlete protests of 1968. Larry James, who is the th uh, third one on the left there, uh, was a sophomore at the time in January of 1968. And uh, the New York Athletic Club was hosting uh, their big games in January in a newly renovated Madison Square Garden. So this was with the biggest, the highlight of the year in terms of uh, the track season uh, at the new Madison Square Garden. Um, the New York Athletic Club had a reputation as being a racist and discriminatory uh, institution. Uh, the New York Times highlighted in the fall of 1967 uh, several uh, athletes who had applied for membership in the New York Athletic Club to run for the New York Ath Athletic Club uh, one of which was a Ricardo Urbina from uh, Georgetown, um, and they were routinely denied for no other reason than for uh, on the basis of race. Uh, they qualified in terms of the, the times and uh, in terms of their education, uh, but they were routinely denied for, for membership in, in this prestigious New York Athletic Club. Uh, and so uh, Harry Edwards, a sociologist from San Jose State, California, le started to uh, talk about having a boycott uh, first against the Olympics and then against the New York uh, Athletic Club. Um, and Larry James, who was a sophomore, uh, decided that uh, he would take this to the team. And so he talked to uh, Dave Patrick, who was the captain of the uh, track team at the time, uh, and br brought up these concerns. Uh, Dave Patrick uh, then um, said, well, if you feel so strongly, I think we should take a vote. 
Um, and the Villanova track team was one of the first uh, collegiate track teams uh, to take a vote. And 17 to nothing, they decided to boycott uh, these games. Um, and from, from then on, they were known as uh, Jumbo Elliott is the legendary uh, track coach at, at Villanova. Um, and so he was, um, the team became known as Jumbo's Togetherness Troop. Uh, because they were uh, voted unanimously to uh, give up their uh, own personal goals in, in striving for something greater. And Villanova became one of the first uh, teams to do, to do this. Uh, the, the track meet went on as uh, scheduled, uh, but there were uh, less uh, schools participated than uh, were initially um, scheduled to. Um, the uh, the ironic thing is that later on that year, April 1968, when uh, King was assassinated, uh, the track team was scheduled to uh, appear at a meet in Tennessee. And as you know, Martin Luther King was uh, killed in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and the team took another vote, and the team decided what to do. Um, and they, they wanted to boycott, uh, several of the athletes wanted to boycott uh, the, the games in Tennessee. but. Uh, ultimately, the team voted to go and compete in, in Tennessee. So um, this project that I'm talking about is very incomplete, okay? And, and uh, as I'm writing, I still have a lot of questions, and those, that's one of the questions that I want to, uh, as I interview people, to find out. Um, what was the conversation like? Was there a different, um, what were the issues at play in going to Tennessee, uh, and why ultimately was the uh, vote taken to, to go to Tennessee? Um, while they boycotted the one in January. Um, but again, another uh, fascinating aspect of uh, black history at Villanova, uh, Larry James, who's on the left there, uh, was part of a relay team that won the gold medal in, in the Olympics. Um, and he was known as the, the Mighty Burner. Um, unfortunately, he just passed away several years ago. Uh, he was a prominent athletic administrator down at uh, Stockton, Stockton State College uh, down in South Jersey. Um, and he um, stood on the same gold medal stand, you know, as uh, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, when they gave their famous Black Power salute. Uh, and if you know the story of the Black Power salute, uh, they were uh, they won uh, the gold and the uh, bronze in um, an event at the uh, Mexico Olympics. And in uh, protest of uh, the discriminatory practices that they still felt. Uh, among the, the U.S. Olympic team and among uh, society in general, uh, they decided to, when the national anthem was played, uh, they raised uh, a black glove fist in the air during the, during the playing of the national anthem, um, to which they were promptly kicked off the team um, and they were sent home uh, by the United States uh, Olympic Committee uh, because uh, the International Olympic Committee said that if they, if they, didn't, if they weren't sent home uh, immediately, that the United States would, not, would no longer be able to compete in the 1968 uh, Olympics in, in Mexico City. Um, and so uh, here's Larry James, uh, a sophomore uh, at Villanova, a 19-year-old sophomore who just won you know, with his uh, team uh, and then goes up to the gold, gold medal stand um, and is, uh, they did not do the black power salute, uh, but they wore the black berets uh, such as uh, Smith and Carlos did. Uh, Smith and Carlos also uh, wore uh, black socks with no shoes up to the medal stand, uh, and they did that as well uh, to protest. Um, as uh, Tommy Smith said, uh, he, he did it to uh, symbolize the poverty of his youth. Um, and so can you imagine that, being a sophomore, you know, thrust onto this international stage uh, of competition and athletics? Um, and so the reaction, again, that's another one of these questions that I have. Uh, in reading the Villanovan, uh, you can read through the lines that, the, that he faced a lot of uh, negative reaction you know, to his courageous stand. Um, the one piece of evidence that I did find you know, was in a local paper in the Suburban and Wayne Times, uh, which is published right out of, or was published right out of uh, Wayne here, uh, and oftentimes re reacted to Villanova events uh, in the newspaper. Um, said that uh, poor little Larry James, and this is almost an exact quote, poor little Larry James, you know, he didn't know what he was doing. He was put up to this, you know, not by the sort of black power advocates, but uh, they actually blamed it on the communists. <laughs> they said the communists were behind this protest. The communists were the ones who, 
who uh, put up uh, poor little Larry James to, uh, to do this. Um, so uh, I know what the community reaction you know, was uh, based on that article, uh, but I'd like to you know, dig a little deeper and find out what the, what the campus reaction uh, was to, uh, to this protest. So it was uh, black athletes that uh, started this, this uh, new phase of activism on campus. Um, George Raveling uh, became um, an outspoken advocate you know, for uh, black students on campus. And if you talk to uh, many of the, the students, uh, they looked up to him as a mentor. And, and what I could read through the Villanovan, uh, they, they looked up to George you know, as, as a mentor. Uh, again, he graduated. Um, several years earlier so he was back as, as an older older man and uh, so he had year, years of experience uh, in which to uh, mentor uh, the younger uh, students who were on campus at the time. Uh, during a speech in 1968 that he gave to student government uh, he left prior to uh, he left in September of 1968 to pursue um, an opportunity with the University of Maryland uh, as, as an assistant coach. Um, he gave a speech to student government and this was uh, out of the Villanova article that talked about uh, his speech. He says, the white students here are going to have to realize something, said Raveling. Uh, the Villanova Negro is no longer content to run like hell on the playing field and be ignored the second the game is over. Um, he is not going to be a good N-word for us anymore. He is aware now of the necessity to act, to make up and stay, stay awake, I should say, to wake up and stay awake during the revolution. The black student will not sleep during his revolution. Um, and so the fall of 1968 was really uh, the pivotal moment in history uh, of black students on campus in terms of uh, their activism. Um, they started to uh, speak out about their experiences on campus uh, in a way that, that white students on campus and the administration you know, could not ignore. Um, and I'll give you evidence of that in just a second. Um, so what I want to do is take you through uh, a little bit of uh, the Villanovan in 1968-1969. And we'll start with an article that was written in, in October 12, 1968 called The Other Villanova. And this was an article based on an interview uh, with several uh, African American students at Villanova uh, who spoke very candidly about their experiences uh, on campus. Um, Jim McIntosh uh, was a prominent basketball player on campus um, and so in a way uh, this I think woke up a lot of uh, students and the administration on campus and really made them aware of, of uh, the feelings of a lot of uh, the black students on campus. Um, so. Joe Burt, he's the editor of the Villanova and says, what are some of your general comments about Villanova and the general situation here? Um, <clears throat> he starts off by saying, you know, I don't think Villanova is completely to blame, but they do hold a lot of responsibilities for the guys here on campus. And that's what we're presented with. Villanova is the racist product of a racist institution. It's as simple as that. They probably have the most conservative campus, if not on the East Coast, definitely in Pennsylvania. The guys are conservative and they're also apathetic, which makes it especially hard uh, for us. Okay. Um, Jim McIntosh goes on to describe you know, some of the social life on campus uh, and it's not, too, uh, it's not too distinct from what uh, Dr. Collymore was talking about in the mid-50s in terms of uh, the social life on, on campus. Um, and he says, uh, right in the middle there, he says, uh, well I live in Philadelphia in the Northeast for the black student that does, does go to Villanova and also lives in Philadelphia. Most of the time when he goes out he goes home or visits a girl or something. But the main thing here is that the main thing is that the social life here is nil. You kind of put a, a black person in a situation like this. You happen to see somebody in the area and you happen to go past a party and you see somebody sitting on a step. You say, oh, there's a party here, let's go in. Um, this is really a direct confrontation. They say, oh, sure, you can come in. They really can't say no because you're halfway gone. Uh, so what I'm saying is that the school itself has reached a de facto segregation so to speak, the complete uh, separatism. This uh, prompted 
uh, a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, editorials and, and letters to the editor um, in which students reacted you know, with sympathy, uh, with indifference, and then also sometimes with hostility. The immediate uh, reaction in terms of uh, the white Villanovan editors um, was one of support, okay? but I think if you really interrogate the support, you kind of get at some of the roots of the problems in a predominantly white institution. Okay? Um, it is hard to realize what kind of feelings are going on inside of Johnny Jones, Jim McIntosh, or one of the several blacks here at Villanova, uh, solely for academics. From what we can gather from their comments on campus life, theirs is a truly lonely lot. Um, it must be something like always living in the public eye, but never getting behind that eye to meet those who are staring at you. Um, we need more Negroes on campus. Without an integrated college atmosphere, there is a tendency that we whites will attain a ghetto-mindedness worse than any uneducated man of a city's slums. We need blacks to complete our community, to complete our personalities, to complete our understanding of all human nature. Once we realize this need, we hope that they will still accept us. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on, on this editorial? Is it sympathetic? Is it supportive? Is it? Yeah. it seems like kind of sympathetic to hear his colonial mindset of we have to study them, we have to know what's going on to better ourselves and the rest of society so we can understand the spiritual aspect of the mindset of this we have to understand. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thoughts, reactions? Yeah. I feel like his insight is way ahead of his time. Like the idea that coming to college is about receiving a diverse educational experience, as diverse however you want to put that. And you come to college to be in an environment that you won't receive outside of college. And I think this young bull actually can understand that even just having people of different races, that's a point of view that's not being accounted for when they're not here, which is detrimental to the learning, because that's a, a side that will never be taught, never be spoken for. So I think it's really amazing that he wrote that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other thoughts? Other reactions? So on the one hand, it's, it's good in the sense that he's, uh, he's advocating for uh, a complete education you know, for Villanova students, right? Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's, uh, as uh, you pointed out, um, it's sort of a colonial mindset, right, in terms of looking at, you know, um, we need more Negroes on campus. And, and is that, you know, uh, to what end? Uh, you know, is it just to complete, you know, the, the Villanova? Or is it to truly, you know, uh, understand, you know, the human experience? Is it truly to, to better, you know, the education, you know, for, for all involved? Um, are they uh, are they doing it you know for wor worthy motives right um, and so uh, you know this was um, a moment of support you know for uh, increasing the numbers and as he points out you know there is uh, as he points out and says it, that it is a truly lonely lot and so uh, their sympathy is there to try to increase you know the numbers so that it's not uh, a truly lonely lot So, with the establishment of the Black Student League in the fall of 1968, uh, we start to see um, many things happen. You know, one, uh, more speakers came to campus, and I, I skipped over um, the Dick Gregory article there. Dick Gregory uh, came to, to speak at Villanova uh, and um, at the behest of, of the Black Student League, um, as well as many other speakers. We'll maybe take a look at uh, Muhammad Ali uh, came for uh, Black Week uh, during 1972. Uh, um, 
And so uh, one of the things that uh, happened you know, during this time period with the, with the Black Student League is they created their own publication, and, they, and it was called the Black Wildcat. Um, and the Black Student League in this uh, article um, talks about the importance of the Black Wildcat. They say it is neither a revolutionary nor an underground response to a racist society or to Villanova itself although both may be frequently uh, subjected to vehement uh, degre degradation. It is not a contemporary commentary on, on daily events on the national and domestic scene unless they fall into the arena of black-white relations. Um, it is not part of a contemporary fad. Uh, it is not a collection and an attempted, uh, it is a collection and an attempted integration of ideas and ideologies taken from the vast reservoir of black talent which is so frequently suppressed within the national communications media. It is primarily geared toward unifying black people by presenting an aggregate of ideas and theories and allowing blacks to th synthesize what they think is functional for their particular group or community. Secondarily, we are attempting to create an awareness among whites, not necessarily an understanding of black theories and I idiosyncrasies, but an awareness that they are being deprived by their own people of hearing the angry response of the blacks. So this is black power ideology. This is uh, the beginnings you know, of a movement uh, to unify uh, black people on campus uh, to press uh, for demands. And some of those demands are increased uh, faculty and staff uh, that represent them, uh, increased uh, courses that represent and uh, talk about uh, black history, um, and increased uh, um, uh, treat, fair treatment, you know, within uh, the ranks of, of housing and um, and selection to uh, student organizations. Um, so the, these are a list of, of demands uh, which ultimately uh, black students uh, press uh, for um, and take several uh, steps in terms of uh, meetings and demonstrations uh, in which to try to um, realize their demands. One of the most amazing events that took place was uh, Black Week. And I have one of the Black Week schedules up here that you can take a look at just to see the, the breadth and, and depth of activities uh, for um, Black Week. So this is 1970. So March of 1970. Um, Muhammad Ali was living in Philadelphia at the time, and um, they invited him to come and, and give a speech uh, on campus. And so uh, it was a dollar fifty to get in, <laughs> and a dollar for students um, in 1970s uh, prices. Um, Roy Innes, who was the national uh, director of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, who was one of the most prominent uh, civil rights leaders uh, of the time, uh, was also invited to, to speak. Um, and uh, in the West Lounge in Doherty Hall, um, they had uh, the Black Panthers uh, who came out and uh, spoke to uh, Villanova students about uh, their experiences and about their, their or, or organization. Um, and so you can see you know, a uh, list of, of prominent speakers uh, on campus uh, that the, the BSL. So the BSL had uh, a huge impact on, camp on the campus discourse around race uh, during this time period. Um, and they did that, you know, through, uh, as you can see, you know, just this uh, brief demonstration through uh, these articles in the Villanova in, in which they uh, talked about their experiences. Uh, they connected it with the national issues by bringing in prominent speakers uh, from the outside. Um, and all the while, you know, working uh, also to um, press for their demands as well. Okay. 
Um, I'll skip over. So um, what was the sort of general white student reaction here? Uh, this is, again, a predominantly you know, white, white institution um, to understand the, the story of integration, to understand you know, the, the complete uh, story of how you know, Villanova uh, responded to and reacted to uh, the civil rights movement and increased calls for, for diversity. Uh, we also have to understand uh, the white student reaction. Helen Horowitz is a, a historian who wrote a book on uh, campus life. And uh, so uh, from a national perspective, uh, this is what she writes about uh, white students' reaction to uh, the uh, increased uh, activism of black students during this time of, of black power. Uh, she writes, as blacks struggled to define their own life on, on campus, white students often responded with various de varying degrees of sympathy, indifference, and hostility. Um, she, and she argues that the moral legitimacy of integration uh, had forced many white students to confront racism. Okay, so the conversation, the moral legitimacy uh, of integration, the uh, Martin Luther King um, you know, speeches, the, uh, the movement, the press to, uh, to press for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, to press for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, these were things that most uh, white students could get behind and say, yes, we should have full equality. Uh, yes, we should have full um, uh, e equal opportunity you know, for all people. Um, but, she says, the turn toward black power uh, enabled them, uh, meaning white students, to return to business as usual. Uh, so once those demands uh, reached uh, or overreached in the minds of, of white students who were not sympathetic uh, to the cause, um, that's when uh, Horowitz argues that white students return to business as usual. And what she means by that is uh, to be able to um, ignore their own prejudices and discrimination on and off campus, as she says in this third quote. Uh, so ultimately, she argues that as black students ate at their own tables, socialized in their own organizations, you know, such as the Black Student League at, at Villanova, um, white undergraduates could ignore their own prejudices and discrimination uh, on and off campus. Okay. Um, so pretty, pretty powerful stuff that, that she's arguing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once, one, once all the legislation was passed, right, once um, equal rights were now in, in full effect, right, at least in terms of legislation, in term, terms of the law, right, um, everybody could sort of get behind that. And, and even, uh, you know, those who were intransigent against, you know, uh, equal rights um, at some level argued, you know, that, that we should be all f uh, free and equal, right. Um, but once that was achieved, and now uh, there were demands for things like black history courses at Villanova. Once there were things like demands for increased uh, admission of African American students on campus. Um, once they started talking about uh, really changing the campus culture and changing the campus climate uh, to the point where they were becoming more inclusive, um, that's where students could uh, return to business as usual. That, that's when they return to business as usual. And I, I, I'm so, sort of seeing this you know, through my research because what I find is uh, during this time period, um, white students were engaged in, in, in some interracial organizing. Uh, and there were some, some successes uh, in terms of that. There was a famous protest at the University of Penn uh, where uh, Penn was trying to uh, encroach into uh, an all-black neighborhood um, and the Penn students started the protest, and Villanova students, white and black, banded together to uh, show solidarity for the Penn students. Um, so there were some successes, you know, in, in that area. Um, but ultimately, you know, when uh, the demands uh, for admissions and, and for, for really changing the, the campus culture and the campus climate uh, come into play, uh, it seems as if the white students, uh, I don't see as many editorials written by white students in support of that. Uh, you don't see the interracial organizing around those, those issues. Uh, what you start to see is the white students taking on issues of 
um, what was termed parietals. And those were uh, the series of um, rules and policies that dealt with visitation rights. Uh, so students who uh, lived in, at this point, you know, all lived in single sex uh, dorms um, and could not have uh, members of the opposite sex uh, visit them, um, this, th these, these were the laws, uh, these were the, the policies that were on campus. Um, and so they often fought against uh, generic sort of student rights and uh, visitation rights as opposed to um, supporting black students along the, along the lines of uh, racial uh, policies. State. And I actually used this article uh, this past year, this past fall, in my training with the Villanovan. I serve as the editor or the, uh, one of the advisors for the Villanovan. Um, and I said, where, where, where's the journalism like this anymore? Where's the uh, desire to go out and write stories and investigate um, and really take on a project you know, like this? Um, around the, this time period, uh, or slightly, slightly before this time period, um, there was a debate going on around fair housing. You know, and, and there were fair housing laws in place, you know, but were they truly effective? Uh, in terms of uh, non-discrimination in housing. And the Suburban and, Main, and Wayne Times uh, wrote an editorial where basically they argued uh, that the problem was not racial, it was economic. Um, any African American that had the money was you know, more than welcome on the main line here, here in you know, Villanova and um, you know, Wayne and, and down towards Lower Marion and so forth, right? Um, that's what they argued. They, argue, they argued the issue. There's just not enough African Americans who uh, have the means in which to purchase the properties you know, to come out here. That's why uh, the main line is so segregated. Right? Um, the Villanovan uh, said, no, you know, the problem is you know, racial. Um, there are uh, still, there's a lot of discrimination you know, in our society, uh, and the problem is not just simply economic. Uh, there's other factors involved as well. Uh, and they took that on as a personal challenge. And so what they did was they found uh, a an African-American mainline realtor uh, who put them in touch with several African-American families who experienced discrimination in their housing search. Uh, and some families who also were successful ultimately in their housing search, uh, but then faced discrimination once they moved into the neighborhoods uh, along the main line. Um, and they wrote an investigative story on this, and they had a two-part uh, investigative story. Uh, and as you can tell, it's uh, the main line facade, you know, hides uh, deep racism. Uh, and so they interviewed uh, these families uh, and published, you know, their thoughts uh, on, in, in the Villanova. Um, so that's, you know, hardcore uh, journalism uh, that didn't just take, you know, uh, one week to put together. It, it was uh, uh, investigating, going out, interviewing people. Um, as you can see, more than one um, writer uh, was involved in this, in this project. Um, so this is an example of, of uh, support um, for African-American uh, causes. And there's also um, one of the things Horowitz says is that some reacted with uh, sympathy. And so uh, Kevin Finneran in, in the Villanova in, in October 19, uh, 19, 1968, in the wake of uh, the article that was written, The Other Villanova, with the, the, the uh, interview with the gentleman in uh, Sheehan Hall. Um, Villanova is a racist institution not because of overt hate, but because of the social structure that leads white to think of the blacks only as athletes, that prevents blacks from having a normal social life, that forces blacks to become culturally bleached in order to be accepted. Uh, and that prevents black students from taking part in activities like the radio station, the newspaper, and the student government. Um, and so the, this is a white Villanovan uh, student who um, is you know, calling on uh, Villanova students uh, to be better in, in some of these areas and calling on the institution you know, to be better and, and to be more inclusive uh, in, in some of these areas. Um, thoughts, reactions? Um, indifference. Again, this article caused, uh, the, as I mentioned before, really raised the level of discourse around race on campus. Um, and so that, uh, this is another uh, response to that article uh, where the students 
drew attention uh, to the plight of, of black students on campus. Um, and so Greg Perman, uh, one of the writers that also wrote that uh, mainline realtor article, um, you know, talked about it. And so he said uh, he was sitting in, in the pie shop with his friends uh, talking about the article. Um, and he said, uh, you know, they wanted concrete examples of Villanova bigotry. I tried again to relate the insidious barrier white America sets up to, pre to prevent blacks from succeeding on their own terms. As blacks with dignity and pride, I tried to explain uh, the demeaning way a black is forced to wa wash white in order to succeed. This carried no water with my friends. They wanted to see racism at Villanova, you know, not in American uh, society. I tried to talk of these things, but I was shouted down. I was told we didn't have to give anyone anything. We didn't have to make... Uh, allowances for anyone who has been slighted by our great experiment. I was told how they always stuck, to, stuck together and why should we intrude. I was told a lot of things. Maybe I should find some new friends <laughs> is what he ultimately uh, concluded. Um, and so I, I say that as sort of, you know, indifference bordering on hostility from uh, his friends, right? Uh, ultimately, uh, Perman is, is uh, in support, you know, of um, alleviating the, the uh, struggles of African-American uh, students on campus, uh, but his friends are, are not so convinced you know, that, it's, that the problem is as great as uh, the students um, in that article had portrayed it. Okay. Um, the one problem in all this is, is part of what I want to do is to sort of strip away the notion that Villanova students were not activists at all. Um, and I would argue that they were active and they were, they were not apathetic in general, um, but it just depended on, on the issues that they cared about. Uh, and some evidence that points that out is um, in the height of this, the uh, uh, student movements on campus, you know, in 1967, 1968, there were uh, takeovers of, of the, the president's office in uh, Columbia in 1968. Um, in the height of that, white Villanova students led a protest. Um, and as you can see from the title, uh, in February 1967, uh, they protested over the food on campus. And they blocked Lancaster Avenue uh, and, and what was known as the Diet Riot. And they took over uh, the dining hall and marched out and, and blocked Lancaster Avenue for, uh, for a while, what was known as the Pike then, Lancaster Pike. And so the, the Villanova kind of laughed it off and said, you know, uh, that the problems at Villanova are more gastronomical than astronomical. Um, in terms of the, uh, the activism of, of students. Um, ultimately, uh, there's two major uh, uprisings over this issue of parietals. Um, in February of 1971, uh, about 400 students sat in on Good Council Hall uh, in protest of uh, the parietals, which were the policies that were uh, geared towards students. And at that point, it was a women's dorm um, in Good Council Hall. Uh, it, it lasted for uh, I believe it was 36 hours, uh, the protest, um, and then ultimately uh, the students were, were removed. Um, and, but the major one uh, took place well after uh, the normal accepted time of uh, student protests, um, and that took place in 1974. This is the one on the mass uh, sit-in for parietals. It says demonstration lasts uh, 34 hours uh, there. Um, in February of 1974, 1,200 students uh, sit in, um, and they sat in on Tolentine Hall. They took over uh, Tolentine Hall um, in February of 1974. February seems to be the, the, the key month. <laughs> um, the Diet Riot, the sit-in for parietals in 1971, and this protest in 1974 uh, all took place in February. So I'm not sure what's, what happens in, in February, um, but look out for you know, February uh, 2012 to see if you see any uh, stirrings of student activism on, on campus. Um, and so uh, 1,200 students ultimately uh, sat in. And this, this uh, protest uh, garnered, uh, if not national attention, at least uh, regional attention. It was uh, covered in the Philadelphia Bulletin, which was the paper at the time, the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, and Villanova received a lot of uh, positive or negative press, depending on, on uh, how you looked at it, uh, over this uh, protest. Um, but Napoleon Andrews is a gentleman who uh, I have inter an interview scheduled with next, next year, or next month. And he um, was one of the student leaders who was in charge of this uh, protest. Um, and so I will uh, look forward to talking with him about, about this. But uh, he at least shared with me that they went to a student government co conference uh, later on that spring 
and they told uh, the student governments about this protest. And they all said, you're crazy. This is you know, 1974. Like, we, we, we did this stuff in 19, you know, 1968, 1969. You're still doing this in 19, 1974? Um, to which their answer was, well, we kind of got a late start, but you know, we're making up for uh, lost time uh, in terms of that. But again, this issue was around you know, mostly student rights and, and parietals. Um, it was not necessarily about uh, black student rights on, on campus. Um, and so to sort of conclude all this, um, uh, we need to take this into the 70s, and that's the part of my project that I am really working on now. Uh, I have a good sense of the campus climate, campus, uh, what campus life was like in the 1950s. There's still some more work to do on that, but, um, and into the 60s where the students, uh, black students in particular, drove the conversation around, around race uh, on campus. Um, but what ultimately uh, happens in the 1970s? Because it's obvious that there's this urgency of protest, there's this urgency of uh, black students coming together, um, but what does that give way to? Okay? Uh, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out now. Is it, is it a sense of contentment, you know, where, where black students, uh, do they feel, you know, finally included on campus? Um, you know, my sense is, is probably not. Um, was there sort of a complacency, you know, among, among the students? Um, was there oftentimes when we see uh, activism declines because there's a lack of leadership, right? Uh, students uh, oftentimes don't, don't feel... Uh, the desire or the need to put themselves out there in a strong leadership role. So was it was it uh, uh, was that the issue? Um, so that's really what I'm trying to. The, that's the next phase of, of discovery here. Um, in terms of the, the Black Oral History Project, um, we uh, kicked it off in uh, this past October at Homecoming. We had a reception, um, and there was a lot of energy around the project. Uh, we had several people from this time period uh, show up and, and agree to do uh, interviews. Um, but what was, what was equally encouraging uh, was the number of young alums who came out uh, to hear about the project uh, and also uh, current students who were here, uh, who were there to, to learn about the project and learn um, how they could help and, and to learn a little bit about the history. Uh, one of the gentlemen who showed up, uh, Bob Whitehead, graduated in 19. Uh, early 1970s, and uh, he later came to one of the Black uh, Cultural Society's meetings um, later on that semester to talk to tell uh, a little bit about his his story. Uh, so it was a great way for students to kind of understand um, the legacy of activism here on campus for both Black students and White students, uh, because again, part of this project is to kind of help strip away the notion that uh, Villanova students in general were always. Uh, apathetic and, and that uh, there was no sense of, of um, compassion for, for uh, rights on, on campus. Um, while not minimizing, you know, the uh, general campus climate uh, and the difficulties that many black students faced uh, on a predominantly white, white campus. Um, and so the next phase of the Black Oral History Project, uh, I have several interviews on videotape and audio tape. Uh, so Falvey Library is constructing a website uh, for us to put up uh, these materials. Um, and so part of my pitch to uh, people who I will interview for the project, you know, is that this, is, this will always be a great resource for them, uh, for their families, uh, if they want to learn about their history, uh, learn about their accomplishments as, as Villanova students. Uh, but also it's a great legacy for uh, Villanova students uh, today and in the future to learn about uh, the heritage at, at Villanova. Uh, again, uh, the heritage of activism um, in particular for black students, but also uh, white students as well. Um, and uh, there were some uh, minor successes with the, with the uh, program already. Uh, I'll give you one, one quick story to end. A uh, man named Ted Freeman uh, graduated in 1972, uh, and he received an uh, alumni medallion uh, from um, the College of Arts and Sciences uh, for his work and in 1984. And he um, lived in Florida. Uh, and lost the medallion uh, in a hurricane. Uh, his house at home was destroyed. Um, and he received my letter from the uh, Oral History uh, Project um, and hadn't spoken to anyone in Villanova in, in quite some time and said, I've been meaning to reach out you know, to somebody at Villanova. You know, thank you for uh, your letter and your, for your invitation to join uh, the project. Um, and he said, uh, you know, by the way, you know, do you think you could uh, <laughs> help me uh, get, a, get a new medal? Um, so I took that on as a project. Uh, we we uh, 
got him a new medal engraved. Uh, it's sitting there uh, waiting for me to take it down to Florida uh, to deliver it. Uh, Ted, uh, Mr. Freeman, promised me that he had uh, several alums down in Florida uh, who he's in contact with who uh, I'll be able to talk with as part of this project. So uh, he's going to set up a little Florida tour for me, a little Florida swing uh, of this tour. So um, it's been a great uh, project to be involved with from, from that regard as well as I can, um, you know, and I'm, I'm the facilitator of this project. I'm there to help, you know, be the historian for, you know, what took place and to, uh, to recognize the accomplishments of, of black students at Villanova um, and to help them uh, rediscover their, their history. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, comments? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm happy to share any of this information. If you're, uh, you know, working on anything for class or projects or anything like that, uh, if you need any clarification, you know, please let me know. Okay. Look for that website soon. It should be up, you know, uh, probably by uh, February or March. Uh, and it'll be sort of a permanent collection on, on Falvey's uh, website, or in, in Falvey, Falvey Library and on their website. So, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.